Hello and welcome to yet another video. This is the third episode of the story in which Hiruzen takes charge and finds a way to fulfill Minato's dying wish. Much has changed in the Narutoverse since the clan heads and Danzo have joined forces to train Naruto. Naruto accepts his parents' and clan's final wish to bring peace to the elemental nations. Join our smarter and more OP blonde knucklehead on his unique path to peace. This story is from Bjdakuch. Please support him. Please like and subscribe to show your support. Let's get the show started. Uchiha funeral words like massacre, traitors, bastards and other such ignorant obscenities were being thrown around the Kanoha rumor mill. Some people were sad, like Sasuke's classmates. Others were mad, like Sasuke, his family and the Uchiha that were loyal and had no idea what was going on. Most were confused. What happened and why? Nobody really knew. A day before the Uchiha funeral, the Hokage put out a heavily redacted version of what happened that night to the Jonin ninja. Naturally, it didn't stay with them long before it reached everyone in Kanoha. Most people were grateful to Sasuke's family, although they didn't know how to feel about the rest of the Uchiha. The ANBU Corps, the clan heads and their clans all attended Fugaku's funeral. Mikoto was crying and flanked by her two sons as the Hokage spoke and had Fugaku's name inscribed on the Stone of the Fallen. The traitorous Uchiha were buried by the clan, but since Fugaku died in the line of duty, fighting to protect Kanoha, his was the sole name carved into the stone that day. Mikoto felt robbed. Her husband of fifteen years was taken from her. Of those fifteen years, only the last two had made her truly happy. The arranged marriage to Fugaku was her obligation to her clan. At the time, she was trying to negotiate with Kushina to get her to share Minato. However, it wasn't meant to be, so she endured a loveless marriage for thirteen years. Then, Naruto's impact on Fugaku had a miraculous impact on her marriage. The man began to appreciate her and show her love. Kami damn it, you better hold him there until I meet him again. Now, she had to be strong for her sons and the remainder of her clan. She knew the times ahead were going to be challenging, so she let out the last of her weakness at the funeral to strengthen her resolve for the future. Itachi took his father's words seriously. An already unexpressive Itachi clammed up a vein further. Members of ANBU thanked him for his sacrifice and offered consoling words about his father. Nobody could possibly imagine being in his shoes, so it made approaching him hard. Of course, one blonde Uzumaki, heck the only blonde Uzumaki, just looked him in the eye and gave him a big hug. Naruto always had a strange kinship and understanding with Itachi. So, when Itachi's bonded brother gave him a huge hug, the single tear for the day fell from his eye. Sasuke was generally a kind boy, a bit socially inept and awkward, but his heart was in the right place. After he severed his bond with Naruto, he got quite a bit colder and less expressive. He developed a language of grunts and shrugs that he used to handle 90% of his social interactions. Most kids didn't know how to handle that. Only the girls in his fan club, his family and Naruto could translate for him. Naruto hadn't seen Sasuke since his 8th birthday party, but today wasn't the time for that. After the funeral procession, Naruto went up and gave the same big hug he gave to Itachi. No words were needed. Sasuke returned the hug and cried into his best friend's shoulder. Naruto waited until Sasuke composed himself and told him that he would see him around. Naruto wouldn't find out for years to come how much this meant to Sasuke. The rainy day drew to a close along with the funeral. Team Ro had the day off, so Naruto went back to the Namike's compound. He had something he had been working on with Kurama for a long time. Today was going to be a test run. Okay, Q, you ready in there? asked an excited Naruto. Hell yeah, Kit. Let's do this. I can't wait anymore to be outside. Replied an overly eager fox. What's the worst thing that can happen? We have studied the notes, the seal and everything else we could get our hands on. Oh, I dunno. 
Maybe trying this will break the seal, kill you and release my wrath upon the world? Huh, Q. Very funny. Now, just in case that does happen, could you maybe promise not to demolish Kanoha? Very well, Kit. You have my word. Alright, thumbs up, let's fucking go. Down in Minato's study, Jiraiya and Tsunade watched on with looks of extreme anxiety. They couldn't believe Naruto convinced them to let him do this. I mean, it is better that he asked them, but they were talking about letting a biju out of its seal. Didn't the Kyubi want to kill them all and everything? These thoughts ran through the couple's minds as they watched Naruto enter his one-tail cloak and make the cross-hand sign. In a large poof of smoke, a shadow clone that looked like a grown-up appeared. Then, almost immediately, it started transforming. The blonde hair extended into long, spiky, and fiery red locks. Holding the hair back was a black bandana along the forehead. Below the bandana was a sleek face, with four whisker marks on each cheek and two narrowed bloodred eyes and had a slitted pupil. The clone was dressed in a long sleeve black shirt that was open down the middle showing off an athletic and toned build. Below the eight-pack, one white and one red sash hovered above a baggy pair of deep red pants. And, imagine Guy Crimson from Tenshura. Karama took a second to compose himself and then stumbled forward to Tsunade, clearly not used to a bipedal form. He took her hand, lifted it to his lips and placed a soft kiss on the back of her hand. Since I saw you through my kit there, I have wanted to do that. Said a smirking Karama. Tsunade was so stunned that she didn't resist at all. She could not lie, the QB was hot, with a capital H. When he kissed her hand, Tsunade's breath hitched in her chest, and she forgot to breathe. The combination of that and being extremely flustered made Tsunade break out in a brilliant blush. Jiraiya's shock ended the moment he saw the QB put the moves on his woman. I mean, even I have to admit that was smooth. Maybe I should put that in my notes late. Wait, what am I thinking, Sunadeheim is my gal. Thought an incredulous Jiraiya. Oi, fox. Hands of my lady, screamed a jealous Jiraiya. Karama couldn't help himself, he could practically taste Jiraiya's jealousy after all. He looked into Tsunade's honeysuckle eyes and hit her with. Hey, beautiful. If that baka there messes up and breaks your heart, you know where to find me. He finished it off with a flourish and a wink. Before Tsunade could respond, Jiraiya charged at Karama. A high-level ninja fight ensued for the next five minutes. Then, Tsunade and Naruto said enough was enough. Tsunade clocked Jiraiya on the back of his head and Naruto landed a chakra reinforced kick on the Karama clone. Instead of dispelling, Karama went flying into the wall of the training room. Wait a minute, he just took a real hit. Isn't he a shadow clone? Thought Naruto out loud. Karama picked himself up out of the wall and said, My chakra is denser, Kit. You gave me a full tail worth, so I should be good to take a couple of lumps. Not like King Kong over there could land a good hit on me anyway. Before Jiraiya could yell at the QB, Naruto cut in. Q, that's enough. These two helped us with this, and they are important to me, so please play nice. Very well. Tsunade Senju and Jiraiya, I am Karama, the Kyubino Kitsune, Lord of the Foxes, embodiment of hatred and executioner of evil. I will tell you the same thing I told him, knowing my name is a privilege that only I may extend. In public, you may refer to me as Q. It's nice to meet you Q, as you know I am Tsunade Senju, slug princess and medic of the Densetsu no Sanin. Said a slightly too eager Tsunade. Karama, eh? Very well, I am Jiraiya, toad sage of Mount Muboku, war of women, scourge of men, brawler of the Densetsu no Sanin and boyfriend of Tsunade. Finished Jiraiya with his chest out and a challenging tone. The air frosted over as Tsunade's ice-cold tone said, Would you mind repeating that second title, Jiraiya-kun? Realizing his mistake Jiraiya threw up his hands in an apologetic manner. 
That didn't stop Tsunade burying him halfway into the training room wall, though. Well, Kit, this test was a success. I am going to check out the compound for a bit. Said Karama waving goodbye. Karama, wait a sec. You said it was your chakra that made it so you could take a hit, right? Could I infuse a seal with your chakra and apply it to my shadow clones to stabilize them? inquired Naruto. I don't know, Kit. Sounds doable. Why not use your free day to give it a shot? Tsunade, care to join me for some sake while I tell you about my fight with your grandfather? asked a freakishly suave Karama. Jiraiya was going to yell at him that he can't do that with his Tsunadeheim, but then he realized he really wanted to hear the story so he just joined them for a drink instead. After they left, Naruto summoned 100 shadow clones and they set to work drawing up the seal. Each seal would be slapped on a new shadow clone with varying results. Naruto had to admit, watching himself punch another version of himself was amusing. By the end of the night, Naruto had created a stabilizing seal. The seal used chakra to absorb damage done to the clone and repair it immediately. Most clones with the seal could now take 23 hits before dispelling. While it may not work when ambushed, Naruto would be keeping these tags on him for his missions. Subsequently, Naruto passed out from all the chakra he burned infusing seals and creating shadow clones. When Naruto went to the kitchen the following morning, he smelled the booze and saw all three passed out on the table and the liquor store's worth of empty sake jars. He just skipped past it, grabbed some breakfast and went to train. Hunting a trader team row was belting through the trees at a fast pace. They were given a mission by the Hokage to capture and return Rokusho Aoi, Aidate Marino, and the Sword of the Thunder God, which is a Senju family heirloom. They left the village one day behind Aoi and Aidate. Naruto figured they should be close to catching up soon. Inu Taishu's summon, a dog named Pakan confirmed as much. Inu, they are about a half mile ahead. I still smell two scents. The same two you gave me leaving Kanoha. Said the talking dog. Okay, team. The Amigakure border is less than fifty miles, and that is a no-go zone. We will catch them by surprise. I suggest Kitsune, a clone distraction and some seals maybe? Drawled out a lazy Inu. Okay, Inu Taishu. Let's keep pretending you want to test me and not just be lazy. Yeah, okay. As long as I can play with him for a bit, I'm in. The team chuckled as they hopped along. They engaged the stealth seals that Naruto gave them and waited in support about 50 meters away from where Naruto was now standing in front of an irate Aoi and a scared-looking Aidate. Naruto started the conversation, Rokusho Aoi, I am charged with returning you to Kanoha where you will stand trial for desertion, treason and theft of a clan heirloom. Blah, blah, blah. Your rights, and yeah, fuck this shit. Are you going to put up a fight or come back quietly? Who the fuck do you think you are, brat? I am a chunin and you are barely out of your diapers. Screamed an awfully piss off Aoi. Ah, uh, shucks mister, I didn't mean it. I was just out her in the middle of nowhere playing ninja. I mean it's not like I am wearing a fucking ANBU mask, you washed out instructor. Taunted a smirking Naruto. Aoi lost all sense of reason, with a scowl on his face and green hair flapping, he charged Naruto. What an idiot, thought all parties watching. Aoi was mere feet away, thinking that the brat couldn't keep up with his speed. Then he saw the boy glow blue and heard boom. The shadow clone exploded in a cloud of chakra smoke with enough force to create a small mushroom cloud and leave a five foot in diameter crater. Get up! washed out Senpai Kuan. I didn't put enough into that to kill you. Said a casual Naruto walking up to Aoi's newly and forcibly relocated position. Aoi jumped to his feet, looking all disheveled and shit, and screamed, now you are going to die brat. He threw his umbrella spinning into the air and called out, Senban shower, as hundreds of Senban sprayed from the umbrella and stuck into Naruto. 
Naruto dropped to his knees and said, Oh no. Itai. I don't want to die. Me just kidding. As another clone went up in a cloud of smoke. Another Naruto appeared on scene and screamed, Brother. No. At this point, Aoi swore he heard laughter coming from somewhere, it may have been the ringing in his ears though. Enough, brat. I guess it's time to get serious. To think a kid would make me use my new sword. Pitiful. Aoi said softly. You got that right. Pitiful was the perfect word, couldn't have said it better myself. Welp, if you are getting serious then I guess I should too. As Aoi activated the sword of the thunder god, Naruto made the cross hand sign. Soon, Aoi was facing ten shadow clones. Now he knew which Naruto was the real one. All ten Narutos made the bird hand sign, and whispered, Futon, great breakthrough. Ten blasts of compressed air slammed into a charging Aoi. The blast sent Aoi careening back 300 meters in the air and he rolled an extra 50 meters. Team Ro watched the defector fly in Dovrand, like a ragdoll shot out of an air cannon. There were OOOs and us as the unconscious body of Aoi skidded across the ground and came to a stop in a heap. Hibichan, could you go and secure the prisoner for me? Pretty please, asked an obviously entertained blonde. Man, Karama is going to be so pissed he missed this one. This has to be one of my best performances. Thought Naruto. Naruto had left Karama at the Namikaze estate. The 46-year-old Tsubaki had taken a shine to his charm, and he was more than happy to stay out of the seal. Ah, you're leaving the fun part to me. I knew I loved you, Gaki said Hibi in a playful voice as she blew a kiss and disappeared in a whirl of leaves. Naruto turned to Idate. The boy was terrified. Yesterday, he broke into the Senju compound to steal the sword in order to get a promotion to Chunin. Then his sensei killed his two teammates and said that he is a traitor now, so his only choice was to defect with him. To an irrational and emotionally compromised Idate, it made enough sense at the time. Now, he has to fight someone younger than himself that just obliterated and humiliated his sensei. Yeah, it seemed to be a bad day to be Idate. Naruto broke Idate out of his panic, look, quite frankly, we don't know what happened. For all we know, you were that guy's prisoner. So why don't you come back to Kanoha with us and clear this up? Idate didn't know what to say. He thought he was a traitor already. So, he asked, you, you don't think I am a traitor? Naruto responded casually, nah, I can feel your fear and distress. You are no traitor. Just a kid caught up in something way too big for you to handle. So, why don't you come back? I know Ibiki will want to see you again. It's not like I could beat. You, anyway. Okay I will come with you said an emotionally exhausted eye date. Naruto walked over, slapped some chakra suppressant cuffs on the kid and called out to his team, Hey Kuma, think you could save us a day of travel by carrying the kid? I don't want to put him in a prisoner scroll. My clones tell me those are super uncomfortable. Kuma simply nodded and scooped eye date up over his shoulder like a sack of potatoes. Naruto picked up the discarded sword and the group returned to Kanoha. Kuma really did save them a day, Idate was slow as dirt compared to ANBU speeds. Team Ro arrived at the Kanoha gates the following morning. A worried Ibiki was seen waiting by the guard booth with the immortal gate guards. Naruto was so glad he skipped over those useless duties. Village patrol was pretty boring, but at least he got to people watch. Yo, Izumo and Kotetsu. Anything cool happened today? No? Well, get a load of this, he shouted as he whipped out the sword of the thunder god and channeled chakra into it. The blade sparked to life and glowed a vibrant, electric yellow. Damn, that is cool. Where did you get that, Kitsune? asked Kotetsu. Picked it up off a traitor. Was the simple reply. Fuck, I knew I should have worked harder. 
The ANBU get to do all of the cool shit. Pouted Izumo. Team Ro dropped off Aoi at the torture and interrogation building and then headed to the Hokage office. Along the way, they listened to Hibi drone on about how cool she thinks the T and I department is. This brought a smile to Ibiki's face for the first time since his brother left. Team Ro made their report and let Ibiki and the Hokage handle the runaway Genin. Summoning fight when Naruto returned to the Namike's estate after a long day of work, he was not expecting a shitload of people to be in his house. It was October 10, 12 years after the Kyubi attack. Tsubaki had organized a surprise birthday party for Naruto. Crammed inside his living room were the following from left to right, Jiraiya, Tsunade, Q, Tsubaki, Shikaku, Shikamaru, Yoshino, Mikoto, Shursue, Itachi, Sasuke, some pink-haired girl, Ino, Inoichi, Inara, Ino's mom, Chuza, Chuji, Chiharu, Chuji's mom, Hayashi, Hitomi, Hinata, Hokage, Danzo, Kakashi, unmasked but never unmasked if you catch the drift, Anko, Yugao, Hei 8 Geku and Daichi, Bear. Surprise, roared the crowd of people. Well, Kyofu, your suppression seal worked. I couldn't sense any of you. Said a bemused Naruto. The party was a great event. After the surprise, the group moved out onto the patio and ate some of Chiharu Akimichi's cooking. Many of the moms, including Tusbaki and Tsunade, were insanely jealous of the rave reviews Naruto was giving Chiharu. He made it seem like he has only ever been fed slop before. Am I right, ladies? The glimpse into the female mind is a terrifying thing. Many cheers were made and presents given. Nobody seemed to know who the super hot redhead was, Naruto just said he is a long lost uncle on the Uzumaki side. The gifts were great, and everything was going smoothly until Q stepped forward and announced his present. As he stepped forward, he manifested a giant scroll with Kitsune written in kanji along its length. When Jiraiya saw the scroll, he paled. Naruto, I found this scroll in my travels and I wanted to give it to you for your twelfth birthday. It is the contract to the Kitsune clan, and I think it suits you perfectly. Kyubi said with a wink. Naruto jumped up and embraced him in a hug. Thanks, Q. I didn't even know there was a Kitsune summoning contract. Well, there has never been a summoner. If you open the scroll, you will be the first. Kurama stated proudly. That scroll said the Kitsune clan is where the sage took the Kyubi from when it was still a kit. Then, the sage imbued it with his power and gave it its nine tails of power. Everyone looked on in awe. Some of the adults were exchanging unsettled looks. The Hokage had approved this with Q last week. Due to good behavior, Q was let out of the compound to explore Kanoha. He approached Hiruzen and introduced himself, which made the Hokage nearly die from shock. Thank Kami Hiruzen had enough sense to dismiss the ANBU guard, otherwise, there would be panic and mass hysteria in Kanoha. This was the first Jiraiya had heard of this. Damn it, why was he distracted by those wonderful works of Kami that were popping out of Tsunade's kimono? He had planned on giving Naruto the toad summoning contract today. He had already approved it with Bunta and Fukusaku. This distress inspired Jiraiya to jump up. Wait a minute, Naruto. Before you go and sign that, I want to give you my present. Screamed Jiraiya as he pushed through the crown to get to Naruto. Once there he ripped the scroll off of his back. Look, Gaki. I can't tell you all the reasons you should sign the toad contract, but if you are going to be my apprentice, then you should sign this contract. Q took immediate offense to this. Sure, he had moved past his grudges and was definitely not still pouting about that giant toad holding him down twelve years ago. If he were at full strength and not being controlled by that stupid genjutsu, that toad would have been roadkill. More time for rumination later, now was the time to win the kid over. Kit, while it is pretty obvious that foxes are far cooler than toads, I will be the bigger man and let you choose. 
Just know that this choice could affect your future in a significant way. There was no way, no way in hell Jiraiya could ignore that jab. The pride of the toads was on the line. Q, would you kindly go fuck yourself? Toads are one of the three great summoning contracts. The toads are useful in battle and infiltration. They can be used as messengers too. Gaki, I have already talked to the toad elders, you are a shoe in You should definitely sign my contract. Jiraiya, never the one to learn the subtle aspects of the political arts, insisted. All parties involved watched the bickering in bemusement. There were more than a few feelings of jealousy that Naruto caught as well. This was a party, not a time to make life-altering decision. So, he did the only thing he could, he played both sides. Holding his hands up in a neutral and calming manner Naruto addressed his two favorite knuckleheads. Thank you, both of you. I feel like this is something that needs more thought, so we will continue this tomorrow when we don't have so many guests. Would it be too much to ask to sign both contracts? Both men twisted their head away from the other in disgust at the idea of sharing a summoner. It was a pretty big taboo after all. Naruto knew he was going to have to talk to the proud Kitsune about it later. Naruto took a more serious and direct tone, later, you too. For now, just go drink some sake. Despite how much the two despised each other's company, they challenged each other at everything for the rest of the night. Eating contest, drinking contest, burping contest, push-up contest. Are they sure they aren't children? Tsunade provided Naruto with the perfect word later in the night, man-child. As the crowd was clearing out and Naruto was saying goodnight to the Hokage, Hiruzen spoke up. Narutokun, could you tell Kitsune to be in my office at 1000 tomorrow? Please and thank you. Sure thing, Gigi. With that, Naruto found the comfort of his pillow and laid the day's events to rest. The next day Naruto woke up and put in his morning workout as usual. He was up to resistance level 4 on his gravity seal. It made any workout challenging, especially with the weight seals set to 50 pounds apiece. It made keeping up with Guy and Lee running around Konoha impossible. Naruto often ran into them during his morning runs. Quite the eccentric pair. Naruto returned to the house, created a horde of shadow clones to deal with the mess left over from the party and then went to wake up Jiraiya and Q. They needed to hash this out. Naruto found the pair passed out on the couch, for two guys that seem to hate each other, they spend an awful lot of time together. A quick water jutsu and some screaming with a side of eggs and bacon later, Naruto led the conversation. Q, Kyofu, you both know that you are important to me. I need a serious answer, is there a middle ground on this? They both responded negatively. Okay, I was thinking about this a lot of last night. Jiraiya Kyofu, I am bound to Kurama. There is no denying that. So, I make this offer the toads, I will be rebuilding the Uzumaki clan. I plan on enrolling in the CRA to assist me in this. Yes, you pervert, wipe that look off your face. Anyway, what if I promise to make the toads the official summons of the Uzumaki clan? The look on Jiraiya's face went from dejected to pensive to content. I will make the offer to the toads, Gaki. You have no idea how much pressure Ma and Pa were putting on me to find a new summoner. They would likely want to meet you and evaluate your character before they make that decision though. Naruto turned to Kurama, Kurama, does this mean you are acknowledging me? Will you progress my training in your chakra? Yup, Kit. We will start on the third tale. As I have previously warned you, each tale makes it harder to control. With your current physique, you should be able to handle three tales. Once you sign the Kitsune contract, our bond will deepen. We will have to return to the Sage Forest and meet the Kitsune clan. With me by your side, you should have nothing to worry about. Okay, Kyofu, can you summon the Elder Toads here for me? I wish to handle this myself. Sure thing. Gaki. You are saving me the trouble. 
Give me a minute to build up the chakra, despite their small size ma and pa cost quite a bit of chakra. After a few minutes, Jiraiya went through the hand signs, bit his thumb and smeared the blood on his palm then hit said palm on the table. With a kukio's no jutsu and a puff of smoke, two small toads in cloaks appeared. The pea-green toad with white hair, big white eyebrows and a white goatee spoke up. Jiraiya boy, did you have to interrupt breakfast? We waited for you to summon us all last night. Jiraiya rubbed the back of his head and replied sheepishly, Sorry, Pa. Some things happened. This here is Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze. He said he wanted to talk to you. Oh, and that there is the Kyubi. Both toads turned to look at Naruto and then processed what Jiraiya said. Then their eyes bugged out and they slowly turned their heads to look at Q. He gave them a casual wave and a, yo. Ma took the reins as Pa recovered from a minor heart attack. Ma is a pale yellow colored toad with a purple perm. Naruto-chan, it is nice to finally meet you. Jiraiya-kun has told us so much about you. I am sure there is much to discuss about. Him. For now, what did you wish to talk to us about? Naruto bowed deeply into an l shape, Ma, and Pa, I sincerely apologize for not being able to sign your contract. When I met Q four years ago, I made a promise to him that I would earn the right to be his partner. Last night he offered me the Kitsune contract. In keeping to my word, I find it only right that I become the Kitsune's first summoner. I am deeply sorry if I have offended you. Naruto stayed bowed until Pa spoke up. It is a shame to miss out on such a wonderful young man as a summoner. Before Pa could close the conversation, Naruto spoke up again. Kyofu informed me that the toads are looking for a new summoner. As the last known Uzumaki and future clan head of the Uzumaki clan, I promise you a summoner from my line. If you wish, I will formally make the toads the official summons of the future Uzumaki clan. Forgive me if I overstepped my bounds, but I wanted to demonstrate my sincerity to have a good relationship with your honorable clan. Pa and Ma had to roll their tongues up off the floor, even Karama was impressed with. Such an offer. Should they refuse, he would have to take Naruto up on that for the Kitsune clan. Little did Karama know that Naruto planned to make an offer to the Kitsune clan for the Namikaze clan. That is a most interesting idea, Naruto boy. I will have to review this with Bunta and the Great Toad Elder. When we have come to a decision, we will give our reply through Jirayakan here. Pa said earnestly. After a little more conversation, the elder toads said their goodbyes and went back to Mount Muboku. Jiraiya was relieved that he didn't have to do anything at all, and his godson might have set the toads up for the foreseeable future. Yuzushiagakor a little while after his talk with the toads, Kitsune reported with Team Ro to the Hokage's office. Hiruzen had four copies of himself reviewing papers and sorting them. The Hokage was reclined in his chair smoking a particularly potent herb. Team Ro, I am glad you could make it today. You are to rendezvous with the Sanin Jiraiya and head to the ruins of Yuzushiagakor. You are to protect Kitsune while he follows instructions left to him by Lady Kushina. Kitsune will assume command when you have gotten to the ruins. You will meet Jiraiya at the gates in ten minutes. When you leave Fire Country, you are to remove your masks and assume your Jonin identities until you return to the Land of Fire. With a salute and a, hi, Hokage-sama, Team Ro disappeared from the Hokage's office and went to pack for an extended trip. They met Jiraiya at the gate, made it out of the Land of Fire without incident and embarked on a boat for Yuzushiagakor. The boat captain was nervous, but when Jiraiya paid him double his normal fee, he shut up. After a day of travel by boat, the captain halted the boat and pointed to the whirlpools. Naruto learned from his mother's scroll how to deal with these. He hopped out of the boat and made a chain of hand signs, bit his thumb and slammed his hand down on the water. The whirlpool collapsed in on itself in a might roar. Naruto jumped back on the boat and ushered the captain forward. 
The whirlpool would only stay inactive for 15 minutes and they didn't have the fastest boat. After passing the whirlpools, the island of Yuzashiagakor came into view, all at once. Naruto marveled at the power of the security seals that were still protecting the island. The captain parked the boat and said he would wait for the group for up to a week. Team Rowan nodded to show they understood and set off to explore the island. As soon as Naruto landed, he could feel that something was off. Such a beautiful island should not have so many negative emotions attached to it. The deeper the group journeyed into the island, the more negativity Naruto felt. The piles of bone and weapons the group walked past only contributed to the negative energy Naruto was picking up. Kyubi offered his two cents, Kit, I know you feel it. This is the energy of souls that have yet to move on. It seems there are a lot of souls that never got the chance to move on here. Our seal is reacting to it as well. Q, do you think I should summon him? I know there are risks attached to it, but I can't get past all of this hate. It is clouding my mind. I don't know, Kit. He may just take your soul as the price for annoying him. Sage, who am I kidding, I know you are going to do it so just get it over with. Naruto called the group to a halt getting concerned looks from the group. Naruto gave them a brief rundown of what he is feeling. Naruto ignored Jiraiya's objections, the Hokage clearly stated he was in charge once they got to the island. That is what he would fall back on anyway. Jiraiya tried to stop him, but he only caught a shadow clone. Naruto distanced himself from the group and positioned himself where he felt the strongest negative energy. Naruto conjured his chakra cloak with one tail and then began the longhand sign sequence that Kurama was sending him through the mental link. For those wondering, Kurama was just reading it off of the Uzumaki scroll from one of Naruto's memories. After a couple minutes, Naruto bit his thumb and slammed his hand on the ground. Immediately, the air on the whole island turned bitterly cold, a silence filled the air and the environment seemed frozen in time. A ghastly figure with purplish skin and long white hair appeared. Two red horns peeked out from the white hair. In its mouth, among rows of rotted and sharpened teeth, was a knife. The Shinigami wore a billowing white cloak that swayed in the wind. Why have you summoned me, mortal, came the frigid voice of the death god. Naruto bowed low, showing complete submission to the god in front of him. Shinigami-sama, forgive me for summoning you without your permission, I have prepared this chakra in recompense for your journey. The Shinigami reached out a long bony finger and touched Naruto's chakra cloaked. It disappeared and Naruto instantly felt drained. Your offering is sufficient, now tell me why you have summoned me, mortal. Shinigami-sama, I just arrived in this land. This is the island of Yuzushiagakor and a great battle was fought here over twenty-five years ago. I felt many negative emotions and your seal that you gave me reacted to them. I learned of your summoning agreement with the Uzumaki clan and wanted to see if you could lay these souls to rest. This is my ancestral home and I do not wish it to stay clouded in such negativity. The death god looked around at something Naruto could not see. He raised an arm and two beautiful, ghostly figures flew out of the cuff of his sleeve. They returned a few minutes later, disappeared into the sleeves and the Shinigami fixed its eyes on Naruto. You have done a good deed, mortal. It is not often that Yami forgets to collect nearly ten thousand souls. It must be the barrier around this island. Your chakra offering and the souls collected earns you a favor from me, mortal. Speak it. What is up with all powerful beings and favors? Thought Naruto. It is a code of honor, Kit. Your father is in the Shinigami's belly, Kit. Just thought I would let you know. With that, Kurama went back to observing. Shinigami-sama, I do not wish to offend by overstepping my bounds. Is it possible for you to pass the soul of Minato Namikaze on to the pure world and restore the other half of my friend here? He said while pointing to the seal on his stomach. That is a great favor to ask, mortal. The souls here are insufficient, though I will grant you this favor. 
In return for the second part, there are two people that live in this realm that have incurred the wrath of Yami and me. In return for restoring Karama, you will need to kill these two people. They have cheated death and are long overdue. Do you accept? For Karama, I will do all I can, Shinigami-sama. Should you have need of me, I vow to answer your call in the future. Naruto said while bowing low again once more. With that, the Shinigami plucked the knife from its teeth, plunged the knife hilt deep into its stomach and swipe it across the length of its stomach. It reached a hand in and pulled out a single soul. Naruto watched the soul take the shape of his father. His father wore a confused look until he saw Naruto. Once they made eye contact, Minato broke out in a full smile. Then, the Shinigami used its right hand and pulled out a glowing red orb of chakra. The Shinigami extended its arm and placed the orb on Naruto's seal. The white-hot pain that followed lit up every nerve ending in Naruto's body. After what seemed like an eternity, the pain faded, and Naruto watched the Shinigami touch a finger to his head. When the ice-cold finger made contact with Naruto's head, he saw the images and names of two people, Kakazu and Haydn. It is good to work with Uzumaki once more. Do hold up your end of our bargain, or your soul and the soul of Kurama are forfeit to me upon your death. If you complete this task, I will call on you again in the future, Naruto Uzumaki Namikes. With those parting words the Shinigami disappeared, along with the icy feeling on the island. Naruto collapsed to his knees, struggling to catch his breath and regain feeling in his body. Jiraiya raced over to Naruto and caught him before he passed out. Naruto was pulled into his mindscape, and he stumbled across the field to where Kurama normally rested. In his tired state, he wasn't ready to see two twin Storital foxes sitting and talking in the field. Beside the Kurama that Naruto knew, was an identical copy, except it had a darker coat of fur that was more burnt orange. Well, Kit. Now you have done it. This is the een half of my chakra that your father sealed away. I have shown it your memories and our interactions. He wishes to ask you some questions before he agrees to merge back into me. The darker furred fox moved from a sitting position on its haunches to a prone position with its head resting on its paws. It took in Naruto from head to toe. I can't believe my other half trusted a human child. One so young. Tell me, Ninjen, why should I entrust you with my power? Um, Kurama? Or should I call you Kyubi? Oh, no, no, no. It has to be Q2. Mused Naruto out loud, to the amusement of Kurama and the frustration of Q2. Do not play games with me, Ninjen. I could devour your soul and end this farce right now. Roared Q2. My apologies, Q2. Names are important to all creatures. Kurama has let me know how important your name is. I needed to know how to address you. That's all. As for your question, you have seen Kurama's memories, have you not? If that character statement is not enough, I will let you think on this. I just made a deal with the Shinigami and now our souls are bound even more tightly together. If you kill me, we all go to his stomach. I don't know about you, but I do not wish to reside there for eternity. In return for your trust, I offer you the same promise I made to Kurama. I will become strong enough to earn the right to your power. I will work with you as a partner to bring peace to the elemental nations and assist your brethren in any way I can. At the end of my life, should I not find a way to free you before then, I will free you before I leave this world. Naruto delivered this with an absolute calm and confidence that added a certainty to his words. Kurama smirked at his counterpart. Q2 wasn't ready for the logic-defying confidence of this blonde gaki. At this thought Kurama paled. I really need to kill that white-haired toad, I am even starting to think like him now. Kami damn him. Q2 was floored, no gobsmacked. He had seen Kurama's memories, but nothing could have prepared him for that. Not even twelve years inside that blasted fourth Hokage could have prepared him for this. 
This child was unique. Q2 found himself agreeing with Karama that this was the child their father spoke of. Q2 looked up from Naruto and turned to his counterpart. Okay, Karama. Let's get this over with. Naruto, before we do this, I have added a door for you to explore when you have time. I think you will find it worthwhile. That is my payment to you for freeing me from the Shinigami and reuniting me with my young half. Naruto chimed in, thanks, Q2. I will be sure to check it out. See you on the other side. Karama nodded and both foxes returned to a seated position, resting on their haunches. They then leaned forward and touched their heads together. A brilliant flash of light made Naruto cover his eyes. When he opened his eyes, Naruto bugged out a little bit. Karama was now twice as big. Naruto could barely see his eyes from all the way up there. Karama smirked as he caught the look Naruto was giving him. I thank you, Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze. I am Karama, the true Karama, as was made by the Sage of the Six Paths. I hereby vow to honor all previous agreements made between us. I will hold you to all promises made as well. A gift was granted you by my Ean half before we synchronized. As for the gift from my young half, it asked me to grant you all of my senses. You already had enhanced senses, however, now when you channel my chakra to your senses you will see and perceive the world as I do. Be warned, it is a lot to take in. Now I need my rest. We will continue this at another time. With that Naruto faded from his mindscape and rested in a dreamless sleep. Inheritance Naruto woke with a start. Anko was sleeping in his sleeping bag, curled around him. This is no surprise, she did it nearly every night in the forest of death. Naruto wriggled out of her death grip and exited the tent. Jiraiya had the last watch and turned to look at him when he exited the tent. I see you return to the land of the living, Gaki. Do you want to tell me exactly what in the hell happened? His tone sounded strict, but Naruto picked out the concern in it as well. So, Naruto recounted his encounter with the Shinigami, the halves of Kurama and the full Kurama. Naruto thought he really should start carrying a camera on his person. The pictures he could get from gobsmacking people would be excellent blackmail. Yes, he thought, yes, I turned gobsmacked into a verb, because I am awesome, Databeo. Breaking from his thoughts, Naruto waved his hand in front of Jiraiya's face. Finally, Jiraiya broke free of his trance. Only you, Gaki. Holy shit, what am I going to tell Sonadeheim? She would kill me for letting you summon the Shinigami. Do you have to tell her? Naruto answered him with a bemused smirk. Naruto felt good today, he felt like he was whole again. It felt like he was stronger. With this thought, Naruto made the tiger hand sign and let out a great fireball jutsu into the air. It was bigger. Almost 1.5 times its normal size, but it wasn't nearly as controlled. Kami damn it. This means I will have to do more chakra exercises, he screamed. This woke the rest of Team Ro. They all checked in on Naruto in their own unique ways. Passing this impromptu checkup, the team ate and then headed to the ruins of Yuzushiagakor. Walking through the ruins of the city, Naruto couldn't help but feel sad. Despite encouragement from everyone, even the new Kurama, the grief lingered over Naruto. Finally, Naruto made the way to the cottage on the northwest edge of the village. It was run down and looked very simple but looks can be deceiving. Naruto channeled some or Kurama's chakra to his eyes and he had to close them immediately. Everything was so bright and in so much detail. Not to mention the chakra he could see fixed into the seal array on the wall. It was practically blinding. He would have to learn how to control this later. For now, Naruto opened the door, broke the genjutsu hiding the ceiling array and inspected it. He had Jiraiya come in too. They both agreed that blood and chakra would need to be provided at three key points on the ceiling array. 
So, Naruto cut his thumb with a kunai to get enough blood to place on the three points. Then he focused his chakra into those points. The ceiling array glowed a vibrant blue and a line of chakra manifested and took Naruto out the door and into the tree lean. It stopped at about chest level on what appeared to be a normal tropical tree. Naruto sighed and he once again cut open his thumb, what is with the Uzumaki and all of these blood seals? Are they trying to drain me dry? With a little more blood and chakra Naruto placed his hand onto the free and felt the seal respond. A few feet away a lock clicked open on a door that was hidden in the foliage. Jiraiya opened the door and Naruto asked the group to set camp there and wait for him. Naruto walked down the staircase and into the dark. He activated his kitsune eyes and had to admit they were far better in a dimly lit atmosphere. Foxes are nocturnal hunters, Kit. We were made to hunt in the dark. With time, you will learn to compensate for the light. With a thanks, Q Karama resumed spectating Naruto's journey down the path. After passing through multiple chakra and blood barriers, Naruto came upon a door with an Uzumaki clan crest. Naruto tried the usual and smeared some blood on the crest and pumped some chakra into the crest, but it didn't work. So, he read the writing on the door. Speak the thing that is the most important to the Uzumaki, Naruto thought that his was easy. He said, family. With that, the first door opened. The next door read, speak. What is the purpose of power? Naruto had to think on this one a little bit. He had read over his mother's scroll extensively. He almost always had five clones devoted to working on it. In the clan histories, the Uzumaki rarely, if ever, started a conflict. There were tales of battles fought to avenge the fallen but most of the Uzumaki clan's battles were fought around Yuzunokuni. That is when it hit him. To protect that which we hold most important. The last part was probably not necessary, because the door started opening after he said protect. Whatever, he felt like he gave the better answer. Naruto came upon the third door. This one was more ornate than the previous two. Illustrations of dragons circling around the whirlpools in the center of each door projected an air of majesty into the gloomy hallway. After examining the seal array, Naruto found a unique blood seal on each door. He had to write out his mother's name in blood over the array on the left. Damn healing factor made him cut open his finger four times for this array alone. He resolved then and there to limit the use of blood in all future Uzumaki seals. This was just getting ridiculous. For the door on the right, he had to inscribe his own name over the array. When this was complete, the doors unlocked, and a barrier shimmered out of existence. Inside the door were two separate rooms. One room held several scrolls lined up neatly on shelves. In the other room were racks of weapons and armor that still held. Their sheen after twenty-five years. Naruto could sense barriers present in front of each room that were linked to a pedestal in the middle of the room. Naruto inspected it for a bit and then fed some of his chakra into the pedestal. A chakra projection brought itself into existence using his chakra. Greetings, my fellow Uzumaki descendant. My name is Orishur Uzumaki, the final Yuzukage of Yuzushiagakor no Sato. I am preparing this message in hopes that a true Uzumaki will return to our ancestral home and never let our storied history die. In these vaults is the summation of the Uzumaki clan's history and achievements. I am proud of all we have accomplished, and I pray to Kami that you will maintain the honor and traditions of the Uzumaki clan. I do not have too much time, but I wish to make a final request. The Uzumaki have always fought for our people and for our home. Do not seek retribution for what was done in the past. Blood only begets more blood. Be better than the previous generations. Seek peace with a strength none dare to defy. Live boldly, so that others may see the example you set. Find happiness in that which is precious to you, do not waste time on frivolous possessions. Finally, use your power and might to help those that cannot help themselves. 
We will be watching you from the pure world, dear ancestor. May Kami protect you. Naruto was silent after listening to the final message of a once great clan. Naturally, Kurama felt he had to chip in. Now I see where you get it from, Kit. It is in your blood. I regret never meeting this clan without being its prisoner. It seems they inherited the sage's teachings. I will leave you to it, but I wanted you to know that I would ask the same things of you. Naruto couldn't help but smile at his partner's words. Despite the tears falling from his cheeks, Naruto felt the happiness of knowing who and where he came from. He couldn't get that from his father's scroll, it had a time seal on it and wouldn't open for another year. Due to this, he felt fulfilled by getting access to his Uzumaki clan history. At the entrance to each room was a master seal. He channeled his chakra into it and the room of scrolls was sealed into a big master scroll, like the one his mother left for him in Kanoha. He secured this one to his back. Before he did that on the armory side, he saw a beautifully crafted wakizashi in the armory. It had a blackened blade that glistened in the ambient light. The edge of the blade was a tinted red metal and thinned down into a razor-sharp edge. The hilt was wrapped in a blood-red fabric, and it had a beautiful, cut ruby laid into its pommel. Naruto could see the seals embedded into the blade. At the base of the blade extending out to about a third of the blade's length was the name of this magnificent creation, Yuzu no Hashi, the whirlpool's edge. This one, this one he would carry on him. Removing his current blade, he placed the Yuzu no Hashi in its scabbard, which was a faded black. With red tinting. Kurama growled his approval from the back of his mind. After making sure he secured all that was left for him and securing his belongings, Naruto made the trek back to his comrades. When he emerged, the sun was setting. They agreed to camp there for the night and then return to the boat. Naruto told them about his adventure under Yuzushio and the message left by his ancestors. He was excited to share what he had learned about his clan. He was even more excited to return to Kanoha and begin sorting through what was left for him. The next day came quickly for Naruto. With first light, the group returned to the boat and made the trip home. It was lively with Hibi talking non-stop about all of the dango she was going to eat and Nico talking about spending time with Hei 8. Jiraiya wouldn't stop giggling, drooling and repeating Tsunade's name. Kuma remained as silent as ever and Kakashi had Ika Ika wherever he went, so no issues there. Before he knew it, the gates of Kanoha came into view and he was reporting into the Hokage. Kitsune asked the Hokage to clear the room and then threw up a privacy seal. He then recounted the trip in its entirety. He had his camera that he picked up on the way back ready. When he was done recounting everything about the Shinigami, he snapped a picture of the Hokage. Hiruzen was so gobsmacked that he did even notice the click or the giggles that followed it. He then told him about the Uzumaki clan library he found. He promised to keep him updated when it came to anything that could benefit Kanoha. That is quite the tale, Kitsun kun Without your teammates here, we would be having difficulty believing any of it. Now, on to something more serious. Kishun and Inu, please step forward and remove your masks. Gasps went out from Team Ro. If an active duty ANBU was asked to remove their masks, it meant that they were being relieved from duty. It was Inu that spoke up, Hokage-sama. Did we do something to offend you? No, no, nothing of the sort, Kakashi. You have been in the core for too long and it is time for Naruto-kun to step into the light. At this, Anko stepped forward and removed her mask. If Kakashi and the Gaki are going, so am I. I have been talking to Ibiki about taking up a role in T&I and, and this feels like my cue. Anko said while respectfully bowing to the Hokage. Very well, Anko-chan. I am sure Ibiki will be glad to have you. I will approve the transfer as soon as it hits my desk. Now, Kakashi and Naruto-kun. I will have Naruto-kun attend the last couple of months at the academy and then you will be his Jonin-sensei Kakashi. Um, Hokage-sama, 
any chance I could refuse? I love working with Naruto, but I am not cut out to teach brats and babysit them. Naruto chimed in, Hokage-sama, do I really have to go to the academy? I can run circles around the instructors there with my level 4 gravity seals activated. This brought laughter to the whole room, including Hiruzen. I have. No doubt you could, Naruto-kun. See this as an opportunity to spend time with your friends. You will be attending as Naruto Uzumaki, for the time being. At the upcoming Chunin exams, we will announce your heritage. Kakashi will be your Jonin sensei because I want you to have reliable backup if any missions go pear-shaped. Are you sure, Hokage-sama? The way I see it, Kakashi Taishu is just going to freeload off me. No doubt about it. Another round of laughter followed this statement and left Kakashi rubbing the back of his head. Nothing he could really say against that. Will my Genin teammates be aware of my capabilities? Will they know I was an ANBU? Yes, Naruto-kun, I am sure. To your second question, regretfully, you will not be able to tell your Genin team. I don't want too much information about you getting out before the Chunin exams. I have thought this out and talked to all necessary parties. One last thing that I wish to say to Team Ro. The Hokage stood up and bowed gracefully, thank you for your outstanding service. Team Ro bowed in return and departed from the Hokage's office for the last time as a team. That night, they went to the bar as a team and ate and drank together for Ro's last hurrah. Naturo used his QB enhanced henge to age himself to look 18, he didn't want people seeing a kid in the bar. He didn't feel like fielding all of the questions that would follow. The night was a smashing success and Naruto had his first ever makeout session. It all started when a tipsy Naruto stood up from the table and asked Anko to dance. He went over to the karaoke machine, slotted in a coin and played, Crazy Bitch. After a wild dance, accompanied by hoots and hollers from other jonin in the bar, Naruto dipped Anko at the end of the song. When their eyes met, she gave him the go-ahead. He planted a confident, yet inexperienced kiss, on the purple-haired snake mistress. When Naruto stood her back up, he saw her flush and he regained eye contact with her. After a meaningful look, he pulled the hem of her collar down and planted a kiss on the cursed seal. Then a kiss to the nape of her neck, finally, he whispered in her ear, I will remove this tainted fucking seal from your perfection. I give you my word, and as you know, I never go back on my word. It was at this point that Enko hopped into the transformed blonde's arms, wrapped her legs around his waist and began a heated makeout session. If Yugao didn't drag a very drunk Enko home that night, kicking and crying out to Naruto-kun, then Naruto most definitely would have become a man that night. Ah, Academy Days Naruto didn't like the feeling of walking through the village streets in broad daylight. His ANBU instincts screamed at him to get back up on the rooftops and use the Shinobi Highway. However, the Hokage asked him to maintain a low public profile for the time being. Naruto had been going to the academy for the past two months. He had to admit that it was nice being able to catch up with his old friends. ANBU life didn't exactly leave him with a whole lot of free time. Walking down the streets to the academy, Naruto kept chuckling as he thought back to his first day in class. Flashback, two months ago, Naruto was waiting outside the classroom door for the instructor, Iruka, to call him in. He could feel the wild range of emotions that the children of the academy let out in droves. It was overwhelming after pretty much living at ANBU HQ, where everyone was trained to keep their emotions, and therefore chakra fluctuations, in check. He heard Irika call for him to enter so he opened the door and walked through. There were nearly thirty kids seated in the classroom, not even one of them registered as a threat. Sasuke had the largest chakra pool, but it was only one one-hundredth of his own. Naruto gave him a slight nod as he entered and walked across the front of the classroom. When Naruto planted himself squarely in the middle of the chalkboard, he turned to the class. I know some of you already know me, to you guys, I say, sup, long time no see. To the rest of you, 
I am Naruto Uzumaki. It is a pleasure to meet you. He said in a confident tone that made multiple high-pitched squeals come from the room. Iruka took over from there, very good, Naruto. Why don't you find an empty seat? Naruto walked to the back of the classroom and sat down next to Hinata. He squeezed her shoulder and mouthed, Heya, which got a brilliant blush out of the shy girl. Naruto sat down next to her and immediately went to chill with Kurama in his mindscape. Hinata couldn't believe it. She hadn't spent much time with Naruto since their training sessions ended nearly three years ago. She looked up to him so much, he filled her with so much confidence. It was because of Naruto that Hinata was the top kunoichi of the class. She kept sneaking glances over at the blonde, but he just stayed unmoving with his eyes fixed on the chalkboard. She would have to work up the confidence to talk to him more later. Ino was so excited that her Ruto was in her class. That meant she would be able to be a genin with him. I might even get to be on Ruto's genin team, she shrieked in happiness and hoped within her mind. She had missed him so much. He seemed to get more distant over the years, but every time they were together, it was like the time apart never happened. They always picked up right where they left off when he would spend time with her on the increasingly sparse weekends. Now, he was here. And he is sitting next to Hinata. She couldn't help the fit of jealousy that struck her. I will talk to him at lunch, she thought determinately. Naruto just kicked it with Q until he felt the class beginning to move. He exited his mindscape and followed the flow of children out onto the training field. Ino ran up and grabbed his arm and walked with him out onto the training grounds. Naruto loved Ino's possessive side. Constantly being around horny ANBU meant that Naruto could pick up on flirty behavior. Not to mention the pheromones that he could sense behind Ino's sweet lavender perfume. Iruka called out to Naruto and broke him from his thoughts. All right, Naruto. Why don't we see where you are at in Taijutsu? Mizuki here will be your sparring partner. Hi, hi, sensei. Chimed out an amused Naruto as he walked into the center of the ring. Hey, Q. How should I handle this? Thought an amused Naruto. You do you, Kit. My container doesn't lose, and I don't like the feeling of that guy. Hmm. I think I will keep the gravity seals on then. Set them to level 5 should put me around Chunin speed. Do I play with him a bit or just knock him the fuck out? Kurama couldn't help but chuckle at this, why don't you put on a show for your classmates, Kit? And then end it with a bang. Kurama's chuckle turned into howls of laughter at what happened next. Mizuki hated being a teacher. He could be so much more and they stick him with a bunch of brats. So, what if he failed a couple missions and his teammates died? He did that on purpose in order to help his master. Now he must fight a kid, this cocky little bastard at that. Mizuki's face morphed into a smirk. I think I will play with him for a bit, then hit him just a bit too hard to vent some of my frustrations. Thought a fuckadinth head chunin bully. When Iruka started the fight, Naruto stood there with his hands in his pockets. Do you not know a taijutsu style, Naruto? asked a bewildered Mizuki. Oh, I know plenty. I just don't need them to deal with someone of your caliber. Step 1, piss him off, great success. An enraged Mizuki charged at Naruto at chunin speed and attempted an easily dodged straight punch. Mizuki swerved into a roundhouse kick and found himself looking at the sky. Naruto had done a small, yet swift, leg sweep that took out Mizuki's plant leg. Step 2, Humiliate him. Mizuki hopped back to his feet and threw a flurry of strikes at Naruto. The blonde, with his hands still in his pockets, nimbly dodged, ducked, dipped, dived and dodged out of the way of Mizuki's strikes. Iruka's interest instantly changed to terror when Mizuki whipped out a kunai in a blind fit of rage. Naruto ignored the gasps from the students and the shouts from Iruka to stop. Step 3, Find a way to justify excessive force. Plan complete. 
Naruto launched forward and planted his shoulder into Mizuki's solar plexus. He followed that with a 1-2, uppercut combo and sent Mizuki flying into the air. Naruto then jumped, twisted and planted a straight kick into Mizuki's face. The chunin flew about 20 feet and crumpled to the ground unconscious. Iruka dismissed class for the day and rushed Mizuki to the hospital. The whole class stood in a stunned silence until Naruto asked in a casual tone, Ichirakus, anyone? He then led most of the class to Tuchi's restaurant. After collecting the money for his demon prankster mission, Naruto had loaned Tuchi. 200 00 Rio, interest free, in exchange for 20% ownership of Ichirakus. So, when Naruto showed up with most of the class, minus Sasuke, Sakura and a couple other fan club girls, Tuchi was ecstatic. It was great catching up with his friends over a casual ten extra-large bowls of ramen. Mizuki had to formally apologize to the class the next day, it was brilliant. Kurama couldn't have done it better himself. He set the memory on replay for the rest of the week and Naruto was forced to mute him to escape his laughter. End of flashback. A morning greeting and the scent of lilacs broke Naruto from his musings. The beautiful smile and shiny blonde hair were worth it though. He continued to casually chat with Ino until they walked into the classroom. Naruto sat down next to Hinata and Ino. Chuji and Shika showed up a bit later, followed by Kiba. He returned their greetings and asked. Hey, Kiba, how is the clan enjoying those silencing seals? And thank your mom for training me, will ya? A big grin spread across Kiba's face, sure thing, Naruto. Kachan asked to have you over for dinner tonight. She said just got back from a long hunt and you would know what that means. Yeah, she wants another free massage. Sure, I will be by for dinner. Tell your mom the price is a bag of your best jerky, I am sure she will agree. Confusion crossed Kiba's face which then turned to a scowl, you better not be doing anything with my mom, Uzumaki. Naruto held his hands up, hey, don't look at me. I just give her massages. It's my uncle Q that you have to worry about. Kiba's scowl deepened. Kiba fancied himself an alpha. So, when his mom started dating Karama and Q put Kiba in his place with his bestial dominance, it left Kiba with a wounded ego. It didn't matter that his mom was far happier than he had seen her in a long time. What bothered Kiba was that his mom insisted on not using privacy seals. She wanted to make a point to the clan that she had found a mate, and Q was more than happy to help her make that point. Side note, whenever Q dispelled his clone and returned to the seal, Naruto got the memories just like a normal shadow clone. That is why he was constantly blushing around the feral woman. Ha, huh, Kit. Go easy on the pup. I still have a lot of unfinished business with Tsum. Chuckled out a highly amused Karama. The rest of the day passed without much significance. The negative emotions coming from Mizuki were far more intense, but Naruto would deal with that eventually if he must. He left the academy with his group of friends and spent some time in the park just shooting the shit. Around dinner time he walked to the Inazuka compound with Kiba. Naruto had to listen to Kiba complain about Q the whole way. He had no way of knowing that Naruto has first-hand knowledge of all the times Q had given Kiba shit. Naruto had asked Kurama to take it a little easier on the poor mutt, but Q insisted that it would be good for him in the long run. When they walked into the Inazuka house, some brought Naruto into a big hug. Naruto couldn't stop the blush that came from all the first-person view memories of Q rutting with her. She had known Naruto for years, since he was six if he remembered that right. She had given him some basic lessons on tracking and helped him learn to track and discern scents. She knew of his tenant, so she wasn't surprised when Naruto told her about his enhanced nose and all the problems that it gave him. It was thanks to Tsum that Naruto could tone down the potency of smells, which was awesome when he was hanging out with Kiba. That kid really hated taking baths. Dinner was always a rowdy affair with Kiba, Tsum and Hana, 
in large part to Kiba's inability to keep his mouth shut. Hannah was talking about her mission that she had joined Saman. Evidently, some Chunin had broken into the vacant Senju compound again and tried to steal some scrolls from their vault. When the alarm went off, the Chunin bolted and fled the village. The downside of being an Inazuka was that they were almost always recruited for tracking missions. Her mom had pulled her for this mission, and it ended with Hannah getting her first ninja kill. She had killed bandits before, but she had never killed a ninja, much less a Konoha shinobi. Naruto gave her a massage to help her deal with her nerves, which made Sum jealous. Naruto summoned a shadow clone to take care of the feral clan head. He really came to appreciate the rowdy and straightforward behavior of the Inazuka clan. Exposed night broke over Kanahagakor with the usual bustle and shining of storefront lights. In a civilian bar, three people were having a whispered conversation. The three were Mizuki, Mibuki Haruno, representative of the civilian council, and Akui Zankaku, chairman of the Merchants Guild in Kanoha. After Mizuki told them of Naruto's strength, Mibuki told him it was because Naruto was the Kyubi. Mizuki didn't bother double-checking this, he already hated the brat, so he went along with the conversation. Akui spoke up, the boy has far too much influence. He has already bought into a weapons shop and a restaurant, and he is only twelve. Not to mention the whole shinobi council has placed the demon under their protection. That demon killed my husband, I will not allow it to spread its demonic influence through the rest of the village. Something must be done. Mibuki said quite passionately. Mizuki chimed in, if he is indeed the Kyubi, and he is protected by the shinobi council, then you will need to secure help from outside the village. Maybe someone like Orochimaru? Akui hissed, do not say that traitor's name in public. I hate the demon, but I will not associate with the snake traitor. This comment earned a scowl from Mizuki. A devious smile lit upon Mibuki's face, we won't have to hire anybody. We will just leak information. The demon possessed the child of the Yandame. We can spread this information and make it seem like IWA found it out naturally. Mizuki's smile exploded on his face, he is the son of the Yandame? That is hard to believe. I bet that the demon deceived the old monkey. I have some contacts that can spread the rumor. However, won't that make the boy more popular in Kanoha? Akui answered in a self-assured manner, popularity won't matter when the demon is dead. Let's use this. Remember that it can never be traced back to us. Mizuki, you are on your own if this leads back to you. Mizuki smirked, don't worry, counselor. I can handle myself. I just want the demon dead once and for all. Two weeks later, Two weeks before Naruto's graduation, Jiraiya burst through the Hokage's window. After waving an apology to the ANBU guard and Hokage, he spoke in a rush. Sensei, I don't know how it got out, but it did. Multiple contacts have been fed information that the fourth Hokage sealed the Kyubi into his son, Naruto Uzumaki. I have heard this from multiple contacts, and it seems the information will make it to IWA any day now. Hiruzen groaned, let out a long sigh and then retrieved his pipe. We knew this day would come, Jiraiya. This is just a little sooner than expected. Lion, please retrieve Naruto from the academy and bring Tsunade and Tsubaki as well. Fifteen minutes later, the necessary parties were assembled, and the ANBU guard was dismissed. Naruto let Q out to join the conversation. After listening to the Hokage, Naruto spoke. Don't worry, Gigi. I have been thinking about this a lot. My clan asked me to be better than the previous generation. I don't want the bad blood between us, Kyumo and IWA to affect my home. I want to be the bridge to peace. This doesn't bother me, but how about instead of waiting for them to react, we get ahead of it. Like we did with Kyumo. Those in attendance couldn't help but be impressed by the young man in front of them. He stayed calm and accepted the danger associated with news like this without breaking a sweat. I think you might be right, Naruto-kun. 
I had planned on sending out invites to IWA and Kumo for the upcoming Chunin exams. Maybe we could slip in a message with that. Sighed out Hiruzen. Naruto looked at Q, then back to the Hokage, Gigi, I have an idea. Why don't I be the messenger? I would like to deliver a message to both villages, and I think they should meet Q. This received incredulous looks from all in attendance. It was Jiraiya that broke first. Gaki, you can't be serious. Both of those villages want your head. Naruto raised a hand to Jiraiya, made a hang sign and slap a stabilizing seal on the back of his clone. With his point made Naruto continued, I want to get ahead of this news. For both villages. I want to write a letter explaining myself and offering peace. As I said, I want to be the bridge. The best part is that I won't ever have to leave the academy. I will overload some clones with Q and head there myself. The worst that can happen is the Shadow clone is popped a bit early. Even then, we would have their response. Gobsmackage. Naruto was proud of his ability to surprise others. He quickly took pictures of each face to add to his collection. After Jiraiya coughed from a fly forcing its way into his mouth, the conversation resumed. That is a most interesting idea, Naruto-kun. Hiruzen looked around the room and got hesitant nods from those in attendance. Will your clones be able to make it there? That is much longer than I have ever heard of a shadow clone lasting. Hi, Hokage GGI. When I infuse some of Q's chakra into them and slap a stabilizing seal on them, they can last up to two weeks. Although the backlash gets pretty severe. Hiruzen marveled at the resource he now had at his disposal. What do you wish to write in your letters, Naruto-kun? One letter will be to the Kages, since both of them have unfinished business with my parents. I will do my best to defuse the situation. I request your permission to enter the CRA and use that to make a marriage proposal from IWA and Kumo, Gigi. Gobsmacked again, successful two-hit combo, complete. Tsunade stuttered out, ma, 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 marriage. CRA. What in the actual fuck, brat? Tsunade's confusion turned into a feminine rage. You think you can just take girls without their consent, do you, brat? Naruto was shaking his head negatively behind a daydreaming Jiraiya. Jiraiya knew this kid was gold. He heard about the incident with Anko, he heard about the affections of the Yamanaka, and he had seen the Hyuga following Naruto around once or twice since he went to the academy. If only he were a toad summoner, then he would be the perfect godson. Jiraiya was forcibly brought out of his musings by a frustrated Tsunade's fist. She was tired on chasing the brat around this obstacle, so she removed the obstacle. A panicked Naruto begged Tsunade to let him explain, with his hands in the air. Back on, wait, wait, wait. Please, hear me out. The K.I. in the room fell marginally, so he continued, my second letter is a letter to whatever girl they may choose. I will introduce myself, explain my situation and my completely pure motives. I will be upfront, honest and I will only marry a girl I love, and her me in return. I want to bring the nations together, but I will not force anybody into a loveless marriage. I need the CRA to bring back my clans. I will need multiple wives to do that. He stopped, took a deep breath, smirked, and continued. Besides, Bakon, is there anyone else that could spoil multiple women the way I do? He finished his point by forming his signature hand sign. Just how much thought have you put into this, brat? Replied a much calmer Tsunade. A lot, Bakon. You have seen my clone debates. Well, after reading my dad's journal and visiting mom's ancestral home, we had a ten clone debate that lasted three days. Gaki, you're telling me those three days you were locked in the study were used so you could. Talk to yourself? Asked a highly amused Jiraiya. Yup. Q was spending the weekend with Tsum, so I used that time to think up some possible solutions. Never thought that I would have to use them this soon though. 
Gigi, while my clones deliver these messages, you should investigate who let this leak. Whoever let this leak knew that I hold Q in me, and they knew who my parents were. That should be a pretty short list of people. Hiruzen's chuckling died out as her heard Naruto finish, right you are, Naruto-kun. I think Kakashi was looking for something to do. I will put him on it. As for your plan, let me draft a letter and have your clones ready to leave tomorrow. When they return with the responses, we will have to talk to the council for final approval. Hi, Gigi. I will get ready. Iwagakor no Sato Naruto clone one in his kitsune mask, dubbed Ruto for this chapter, and Q traversed through the mountain ranges of IWA. They were halfway through their second day of travel when they were halted by an IWA patrol, which was extremely wary of Ruto in his kitsune mask. Kitsune had become an internationally known mask over the last two years, and he had earned a fierce reputation. After a tense exchange and showing the scroll with the Hokage seal, the patrol escorted Ruto and Q into IWA and into the Tsuchikage's waiting room. After fifteen minutes or so, he was called into the Tsuchikage's office. Anoki had heard of Kitsune. He had even been aware of some of his missions over the past two years. That is why he was surprised when a five feet four inch tall boy in a Kitsune mask stood in front of him with an imposing Q standing behind him. Good afternoon, Tsuchikage sama I am Kitsune, this is Q, and we have been tasked to deliver three messages to you. I request permission to take out the scrolls and to remove my mask. Said a boyish voice in a very mature tone. The Tsuchikage hesitated. Why on earth would Hiruzen send an ANBU here and have it unmask itself? He wanted to see how this played out, so he gave a slight nod to Kitsune and kept an eye on Q. When the boy removed his mask, Anoki vaulted out of his chair and pointed a finger at Ruto from just over his desk. He then cried out in pain as he tweaked his back. You. You. Who are you? I heard a rumor about you yesterday, but I will have my answers now. Bellowed a confused and irrational Anoki. Ruto gave a slight bow, I am Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze, this is my partner Q, the Kyubi no Kitsune. We have come in good faith to offer you a chance for peace. For too long have ancient grudges wreaked havoc among our people. Your attack on the Uzumaki, my father's destruction of your forces and the petty squabbles that have continued since. I come in good faith to break this cycle of hatred. I have written out all of my reasons in this letter to you, Tsuchikage sama Naruto could feel the K.I. radiating off the Golem guards in the room. Golem is Iwa's ANBU. The Tsuchikage's outrage turned. Into a bizarre sort of respect. This young boy, the son of Iwa's proclaimed greatest enemy, walked willingly to his office without a trace of fear. Then he claims that his partner, standing next to him is the Kyubi. Wait. The Kyubi. Anoki's realization and subsequent battle-ready stance were the cue the Golem guards had been waiting for. They surrounded the pair and held all forms of pointy objects at kill points on the two. The pair never moved a muscle. They sat there, looking amused at the Tsuchikage. You better have a good reason for bringing the Kyubi into my village, boy. This could be seen as an act of war. You have one minute to save your own life, so speak. Tsuchikage sama, I carry Q with me everywhere I go. Him and I are bound by the Shinigami. I brought him here in this form as a demonstration of my strength, resolve and most importantly my sincerity. I wish to be the bridge to peace. I have come to deliver the invitation to Kanoha's Chunin exams, a letter from me to you and finally, if you approve of my offer, a letter for a woman of good standing in IWA that would be willing to let me court her. Replied the blonde in an even and calm tone. Gobsmack struck again. I count five jaws hitting the floor. It took Anoki over a minute to snap out of his stupor and return to his seat. As he did so, the golem guards withdrew their weapons. You are young, boy, however, I find your boldness intriguing. That look in your eyes is just like your father's. 
Ohanki let out a deep sigh before continuing. Truth be told, IWA and Kanoha were to begin peace talk a couple of months before the QB there attacked your village. Tell me, will you be participating in the Chunin exams? I don't see a Hishiate on you. Hi, Tsuchikich-sama. Due to my unique heritage and tenant, I was kept in the shadows for most of my life. Kitsune is no more and cannot be linked to me. I am currently finishing at the academy where I will join a normal genin squad and start my career. I assure you, there will be heavy restrictions placed on me in the Chunin exams. I promise that I will not personally kill any personnel you are willing to send. I know there is a significant and difficult to overlook history between our villages and clans. What I humbly ask for, Tsuchikich-sama, is the chance to demonstrate my sincerity and resolve. Anoki couldn't stop a begrudging respect from growing roots in his chest. For your response, I will accept the invitation to the Chunin exams. We will send a messenger hawk with the teams and names. For your request for peace, I will read your letter and give you my response should you make it to the finals of the Chunin exams. For your third request, I must talk about it with my counsel. I would not expect a prompt answer on this. In return, I ask you to tell me on thing. After a nod from Rudo, he continues, why do this? A small smile flickered across Rudo's face, Suchikich-sama, I recently visited Yuzushiagakor and received the final request left by my mother's clan. I have read the journals of both of my parents. The one goal that I embrace is guiding the shinobi world to peace. I want to create a world where my future grandchildren can flourish without the threat of death looming over them. I want to unite the nations, not under one banner, but under a common goal. I want to bring as much happiness as I can to as many people as I can. One of your esteemed age and experience can surely understand that desire. For the debts and grudges of the past to be settled, I will become a leader of unrivaled strength that will light up a better path. Of this, I give you my word, Tsuchikage. And I never go back on my word. Anoki saw Q nodding his head proudly at the bold declaration of this boy. He couldn't help but feel the same. Tell me, Naruto, how did one so young gain so much wisdom? I have never seen a boy carry himself the way you have. Ruto scratched the back of his head sheepishly, I had a lot of people invest their time into me. I fostered a relationship with one of the most ancient and powerful beings in existence. The QB was now nodding its head enthusiastically with an aura of pride radiating off it. But mainly, I was taught etiquette by the Hyuga. Ruto finished with a sheepish chuckle. Anoki stood up and walked to the boy. Very well, Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze. I, Anoki of both scales, the fence sitter of IWA and the third Tsuchikage of Iwagakor no Sato, promise that I will consider your offer of alliance. I will deliver my answer to you at the Chunin exams. I will be watching you. Do tell that old monkey, well played, from the Tsuchikage. As he said this, he reached out his hand for a handshake, which Naruto confidently returned. After that, Ruto and Q departed from IWA, leaving an old man with a lot to think about. Anoki moaned when he thought about the response of the council. There will be many that will vehemently oppose this. I hope you are ready, my boy. You just made a statement to the world. Anoki would remain trapped in his thoughts until his raucous granddaughter forcibly extracted him a few hours later. Once they were out of IWA, Ruto and Q dispelled since they didn't have a solid message to return with. In the academy, immediately following Ruto dispelling, Naruto screamed out in shock and pain as the memories suddenly hit him and then his head hit the desk. Everyone was concerned, but Ino and Hinata were spazzing out. Iruka let Mizuki take over the lesson and took Naruto to the school nurse's office. He also sent a teacher to inform the Hokage what happened. When Hiruzen showed up with Tsunade, they found Naruto munching on some cookies from the nurse's office and in perfect health. He informed them that it was just his clone he sent to IWA dispelling when he was unprepared for it. 
Kyumagakura no Sato AI, the fourth rakage of Kyumo, was an immensely proud and terrifying man that rarely, if ever, wore a shirt. He was six feet. One inch with slicked back blonde hair that went down to the base of his neck. His broad shoulders and ripped chest emanated power. The eight-pack could be seen peeking over what looked like a golden prize fighter's belt. This belt was a ward to those that took down the gyuki when it rampaged. He wore three massive arm bracers on each wrist that weighed 100 pounds each. In short, AI was a beast of a man. AI was in the middle of talking to Killer B and Yujito when a squad of Bolt appeared in front of him. Rakage sama we have apprehended two ninja that are bearing a scroll with the seal of the Hokage. Well, let's see them then. Replied AI in an almost bored tone. When Naruto cloned two wearing the Kitsune mask, dubbed Nero for this chapter, and Q walked through the door, Killer B and Yujito jumped in front of the rakage and assumed defensive postures. Yujito, B, what is the meaning of this? Demanded AI. You should be asking him, Rakage sama That boy is the Jinchuriki of the Kyubi. Said Yujito preparing for a fight. Easy, Matatabi and Gyuki, we do not seek a fight. Said Karama in a bored tone. My kid here just wishes to speak with you and your Rakage. Quite lucky, kit. Two of those you seek are right in front of you. This got incredulous reactions from B and Yujito. Nobody should know their partner's names. Nero held his hands up in the universal sign for, I come in peace. With an even tone, Nero spoke. Rakage sama I am going to remove my mask and bring out three scrolls. I am here in good faith and wish to discuss some things with you. AI replied. Why would you reveal your identity, Kitsune? You are a well-known ANBU operative. Nara chuckled, this is the last act of Kitsune, Rakage sama He is to come out of the shadow and into the light. You will see why my identity is relevant if you give me permission. Now AI was intrigued. He towered over the boy, in every sense. Yet the calm aura the boy was radiated made him want to listen. Not an easy task, ask the repair crew that is constantly fixing his office walls. Very well, Kitsune. Let's see what you have to show me. Nero's posture relaxed, he slowly moved his hand to his face and removed the mask. AI was gobsmacked immediately, while B and Yujito were intrigued. My name is Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze, partner to the Kyubi no Kitsune. I come bearing three scrolls. An invite to the upcoming Chunin exams in Kanoha, a letter from myself to you, Rakage sama and I will reveal the third letter after our conversation. B and Yujito joined AI in his gobsmacked stated. Kyubi took a mental picture so he could share it was Gyuki and Matatabi later. AI recovered and made a movement with his finger, after which Yujito retrieved the scroll and letter. Very well, Naruto Uzumaki. You have my attention, state your reason for being here. Thank you, Rakage sama with a small bow he continued, I have come to bury the proverbial hatchet. I am aware that you do not share in some of your father's more questionable ambitions. I wish to bring peace to the elemental nations. I do not wish for Kanoha to rule or to subjugate nations under my banner. I have come to be the first step in the long and arduous effort to achieve peace. I read of your battle with my father in his journal. He commended you as a ninja of great speed and talent, but more than that he praised your character. He saw you as a man that valued integrity and courage. I have come in person to deliver these messages to you as a demonstration of my strength, courage and sincerity. Kid are you telling me that Kanoha is seeking a new treaty with Kyumo? Also, the rest of your claims are quite bold. So, you appeared as Kitsune as a demonstration of your strength, huh? Nara chuckled and recomposed himself before speaking, no, Rakage sama I came as Kitsune so only those in this office would know my identity. I came with Kyubi, he pointed behind him with his thumb, as proof of me strength. 
I revealed my identity to you as a show of my sincerity and by doing this I am taking the first leap of faith. A.I. marveled at the boy. Not even a teenager and he maintained his composure in front of Akage and two Jinchuriki. He had been looking for a way to de-escalate tensions between Kyumo and Kanoha. He would need to be sure before he committed to this. I see no reason why Kanoha would begin talks after the Hyuga incident. Tell me boy, what does your Hokage seek to get from Kyumo? Naruto laughed at this, you misunderstand, Reikage sama The invite to the Chunin exams is the only thing from the Hokage. The rest is from me. Of course, I got Hokage-sama's permission to do this and write to you personally. I found the library of my mother's ancestral clan and to gain access, I swore an oath to the fallen Uzumaki. An oath I had already made to my partner Karama over there. A pregnant pause followed the casual use of Karama's name. Inside B in Yujito, the Biju couldn't believe what they just heard. The sage was the only person Karama had ever given his name to. Now, this boy knew his name and wielded his power? And Kami damn it all, how did the boy let Karama out of his seal? The ranting biju made both Jinchuriki close their eyes and cut the connections to their biju. A.I. was curious, his curiosity was eating him alive. What oath could the boy have sworn to gain the biju's trust? Okay, boy. You have my undivided attention. I wish to hear your oath so I may judge it as your biju has. Nara nodded to the rakage's request. He brought his heels together, stood up straight, brought his right fist over his heart and exclaimed. I am Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze, I vow to become the Hokage and use that power to bring peace to the elemental nations. I vow to use all my strength to protect that which I hold dear. I vow to earn the respect of my partner, Karama, to earn the privilege of wielding his power. I will use the totality of my power and influence to create a better world. For as many people as I can. I will sacrifice and suffer to be the bridge to peace. I vow to never go back on my word. Until all vows have been met, I will never give up. Naruto said his vows while maintaining eye contact with the rakage the whole time. A.I. had never been more pleasantly surprised in his life. This young man is unwavering. He could feel Nero's resolve. The brilliant azure blue eyes show the depth and power of his soul. His face and posture were unshakable. Behind Nero, A.I. noticed Karama adopting a proud parent look. A.I.'s thoughts could really be summarized in one word, unfucking believable. Yes, it's hyphenated you motherfuckers, so it is one word. A.I. cleared his mind and refocused on the boy. Very well, Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze. I, A.I. the fourth rakage of Kumagakor no Sato, hereby receive and acknowledge your vows. Should you break them, the price to me will be your life. A.I. paused here. Now, the biggest question to me is how do you wish to Kumo fit into your vows? Nero produced the third letter and handed it to A.I. I propose a political marriage between Kyumo and Kanoha. As head of the Uzumaki and Namikaze clans, I am assigned the great task of rebuilding both great clans. I am enrolled in the Clan Restoration Act and will take multiple wives. The third letter is to any you wish to give me the honor to court. Naruto paused here because of the K.I. Yujito was radiating. I do not ask this lightly. I will only marry a woman I love. I will not accept any who are forced to marry me, or those who attempt to marry me for power. I vow to my ancestors that I will treasure any and all women that bestow that honor upon me. If the idea of a political marriage is appealing to you, and you do not wish for me to be the one selected, then the Hokage said you may select another eligible clan heir. A.I. couldn't believe the brass sack on this kid saying that he will be the bridge to peace and then requesting a political marriage for himself, that's insane. Or it would be insane for any man that didn't earn A.I.'s trust. He believed the boy to be earnest. He couldn't sense any darkness in the boy. That is a most interesting proposal. You got quite the pair on you, kid. 
I will address this with my counsel and see if there are any girls that may be interested. How would you court them? At this, Naruto threw a familiar three-pronged kunai to Ai, hilt first. In his stupor, Ai nearly dropped the softly thrown kunai. Ai adopted a serious look and said, You can use the flying thunder god? A mischievous shrug was his response. The boy looked Ai in the eye but gave nothing away. Ai could do nothing but chuckle. Very well, go with B in Yujito. I will talk with my counsel and get you a response in two days. B and Yujito walked with Kitsune and Q through Kyumo. They understood his desire to keep his identity hidden. The yellow flash left quite the mark on Kyumo's forces after all. They made small talk as they walked through Kyumo. B. Rapping and rhyming in his ridiculously offbeat way. Nehru appreciated that though, it was genuine. Q was just laughing his ass off at his brother's container. Yujito and Matatabi had gotten used to B's antics, but even they were embarrassed in front of the boy and Q. Nehru could sense an underlying tension between Yujito and himself, but Naruto decided it would be up to her when to confront it. Meanwhile, Matatabi was purring seductively in Yujito's ear telling her to jump Q's bones. Nehru was led to a hotel where he would stay overnight, the clone didn't need to sleep, but it did need to conserve chakra. After the Naruto clone fell asleep, Q snuck out of the room and met up with Yujito at a bar. While they were drinking, Q gladly talked to Yujito and Matatabi about Naruto's life. He sounded so much like a doting parent that Yujito couldn't help but find him attractive. What, dads are sexy? Then, when the drinking took effect Q asked Yujito about her experiences in Kyumo. Her strength of spirit to overcome the discrimination of the village and earn respect inspired Q. The space between the two shrank as the night went on, much to the pleasure of Matatabi. Q walked Yujito back to her apartment, as you would expect from a gentleman-like being of his age and stature. At the door to Yujito's apartment, Q gave Yujito a passionate kiss, which Yujito returned. However, Yujito pulled away and said good night. Don't you dare walk away from that fucking hunk. Rip his clothes off. Roared an extremely turned and cat biju. He is a stranger, Tabi. A kiss is all he will get from me. Replied Yujito with as much self-restraint as she could. As Yujito was unlocking her door, Matatabi flared her chakra and took possession of Yujito's body. Her eyes became a deep aqua blue and her pupils slitted. Her nails elongated and she started breathing heavy in response to Q's aura. Tabi, hereby referring to Yujito's Matatabi-controlled form, ripped her hand away from the door after she unlocked it, turned around and started an intense make-out session with Q. After a few minutes of making out, Tabi walked back to the door with an overly exaggerated and sensual sway to her hips. I have waited centuries to do this, don't let me down Foxy-kun. She whispered over her shoulder as she opened the door. Triple X Lamonish start Triple X you didn't need to tell the great Karama twice. This Ninjen was sweet, like the forbidden nectar. Q was so turned on that he didn't realize that he was essentially making out with his sister, but that's just a minor detail. He eagerly followed Tabi into the apartment. The making out intensified and both Biju were losing themselves in the lust and sensations of the moment. Q threw her on the bed and savagely ripped off Tabi's shirt, Yujito's protests in the back of Tabi's mind didn't register with Tabi, she was lost in lust. His hands roamed her now bare body as he positioned himself between her legs. Q took Tabi's right breast into his mouth and alternated between nibbling and sucking on the perky bud. Tabi's hands roamed through Q's hair as she pushed his head down to her honey pot. Once again, Q couldn't bother with the fabric. The only thing on his mind was the sweet nectar that was emitting an intoxicating aroma, hidden in a tiny, pink fold of flesh. Q lightly inched a finger in, and his tongue began tickling the bundle of nerves at the top of the slit. The taste was divine as Q could taste Matatabi's chakra flowing into the juices. After a few minutes of ministrations, 
Tabi was getting close to her first orgasm. As she hit her high point, her nails elongated, and her grip tightened. As she screamed out her pleasure there was a pop and a poof of smoke. Tabi roared in a chakra-enhanced voice, fuming mad as Yujito tried to take control of a demoness that had been denied her just deserts. It took Yujito a minute to forcefully take control of her body back and lock the naughty cat back in her mindscape. She let out a deep sigh, torn between being relieved and sorely disappointed. Triple X Lamonish and Triple X Meanwhile, back in Kanoha. Kurama was resting inside of Naruto's mind. When the forty-story fox got the memories of its clone, it sprung a massive heart on. Who knew shadow clones could transmit blue balls? Naruto was forcefully awakened from his sleep by a pouting Kyubi. The massive fox was roaring loudly in his mind complaining about stupid shadow clones. It wasn't until Naruto woke up in the comfort of his bed that he processed the memories. The teasing he gave the pouting fox only incensed it further. So, Naruto hopped out of bed, jumped out to the training grounds, formed Q with one tail worth of chakra and began an all-out spar. Q apologized after three long hours of venting. Naruto was burned, beaten and his clothing shredded by Q's claws and sneaky fox taijutsu style. Back to Kumo, the following morning, Nero was woken up by a pounding on his hotel room door. The clone wiped the cobwebs from its eyes and went to the door. Where the fuck is that perverted fox? Screamed an enraged Yujito. Um, Yujito-san. What are you talking about? What happened to Q? Asked Nehru in the most innocent tone. Yujito had almost forgotten that the boy in front of her was only twelve. The cute way he asked that question immediately converted her rage into embarrassment. How could she explain what happened to a preteen? Had he even gone through sex yet? Um, Narchuo chan, have you seen Q? We were um. Hanging out. Last night and he kind of. Popped. All that's left was smoke. Nero's eyes bulged as he put the pieces together. He had to come up with something, quick, or they would find out he is a shadow clone too. Yujito san, did you perhaps injure Q? The jutsu I used to let him out is quite fragile and takes a lot of chakra. So, I can't exactly let him out again. Can you tell me what happened and why you are mad at him? Asked Naruto in his most innocent. Tone. He could put two and two together, but it was so much fun teasing this Kumo Jonin. Um. I. We. He. Ah uh, don't you worry about it, Naruto-chan. Just tell him he owes me next time we see each other. Bumbled out an ultra-embarrassed Yujito. Will do, Yujito-san. I will see you when the rakage summons me. Have a great day. Replied Nero as he closed the door. Once she was gone, Nero burst out laughing. He could only imagine how pissed Karama was and how much hell he raised with the boss. The next morning, Nero was summoned to the rakage's office. Kyumo had agreed to the marriage of their finest Kunoichi Naruto's age, Samui. Samui was a buxom blonde, with short shoulder-length hair. She had icy-colored eyes the similar to Naruto and she had a long, red-handled katana strapped to her back. Samui was thirteen and was an inch shorter than Nero was. When Nero made eye contact with her, the usually stoic blonde Kunoichi blushed and looked down at the ground. A blush flared on Nehru's face as well in response to Samui. He swore that if the boss didn't treat her right then he would summon himself from the boss's chakra and kick the boss ass. A.I. and Yujito noticed this and were happy to see an initial spark was there. Yujito had brought the proposition to Samui the night before. She delicately worked her way into the subject by telling Samui about the meeting with the rakage. She couldn't believe that she may end up marrying the Yellow Flash's son. Samui was given the letter to read by Yujito and this is what made her take the leap. To my chosen one, please know that I write my true feelings into this letter. My name is Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze, and I am the son of Kushina Uzumaki and Minato Namikaze. 
I do not tell you my lineage to entice you nor to intimidate you. I tell you because I never knew my parents and their memory is important to me. I want them to watch me make out world a better place from the pure world. First and foremost, for a potential life partner, I am the host of the Kyubi no Kitsune. I have befriended him, and he will be with me, hopefully us, for the rest of my life. I have made promises to him that will make the path I walk a difficult one. It is my hope that I may get to know you so that you could join me on my journey. I am a training nut, if you agree to marry me, I will show you the secrets to my training method. Unfortunately, it is one that is probably unique to Jinchuriki, but I would do everything I can to help you improve. I value family and friends above all else, they are the reason I work so hard. I struggle to gain power so that I may protect them and build a better life for them and future generations. I will not tolerate liars, schemers, or traitors. I know your loyalty is to your village and I would never seek to change that. My hope is that our union could strengthen the ties between our villages and become a step forward on the path to peace. Now comes the hard part. I am the last known member of two. Historical clans. My mother was the princess of Yuzushiagakor before its fall. When I visited my ancestral home, I vowed to rebuild my clan. I was due to be enrolled in the CRA, but I volunteered for early entry so that I may control my destiny. I will not marry for money, children, jutsu, influence or anything short of love. I know it seems preposterous that a boy you do not know is promising you love. If you cannot tell from this letter, ask you Kage. I know I will make the right impression and they should be able to speak to my character. I write this to you before I meet them, but I am sure my light will reach them. I do not ask for an answer immediately. All I ask is that we may exchange letters and get to know each other. I wish to meet you and spend more time with you at the Chunin exams in Kanoha. I want to be your friend first to see if I could be your lover always. With best intentions, Naruto Uzumaki Namike's Samui was blown away by the raw emotion and honesty she felt conveyed in the letter. She could tell whoever wrote it meant every single word. She did not know how she felt about the sharing part of it, but she did know that she would give it a try. Hell, most women never get to feel half the love Samui could feel from that letter. When her eyes met the brilliant azure blue orbs, the stars aligned and Samui believed she had found her life partner. That is why for pretty much the first time in her life, Samui blushed and was forced to break eye contact. After a brief conversation with the rakage, which included an explanation of what happened to Nehru's partner, Nehru secured the rakage's reply scroll, donned his kitsune mask and returned to Kanoha the old-fashioned way, a whole hell of a lot of running. The clone was running very low on chakra when it approached Kanoha during the second night of its travel. It took the ANBU entrance and took the reply scroll to Naruto in his father's study. When Nehru dispelled, the backlash rendered our blonde hero unconscious with his head planted firmly in a stack of seals. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to like and subscribe, and don't forget to share this video with your friends. Guys, make sure to help the author by visiting the link in the description. This is Fox Sage, and I'm signing off.